the name for numinous in 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 uh, in our work especially shakti work is sambhavopaya right and what i am teaching you here is a very difficult exercise but once you get it your open eyed meditation will begin right and the official name of this mudra is called sambhavi mudra meaning half open eye looking up mudra right sambhavi mudra so sambhavi is related to the goddess bhuvaneshwari and we are going to who is the goddess of the sound hrim hrim and i'm going to come to that in a minute but bhuvaneshwari is the goddess who is the most powerful goddess we don't talk about her very much because she is adi shakti she is the primal mother the first mother and what we what we do with her is that in sh true shaktiism it is considered that bhuvaneshwari is the supreme being not shiva not non dual even the mother is supreme now that is a very old cult in india that was demolished and destroyed you know because it's the absolute end of shaktiism which is that the supreme being is feminine we are in her womb this is her emanation and we are her in our bodies right what lies beyond is nothingness vast complete non dual consciousness no shiva no nothing in fact she sits on shiva right white shiva meaning sada shiva non participatory shiva it doesn't count she is the supreme being and this is a very interesting way of looking at life because yogis and all will not talk about this because it's very rare for us to talk about shakti being the supreme being very rare agreed we don't talk about that we talk about shiva shakti we talk about sada shiva brahman we talk about god yahweh whatever but we never talk about the mother being the supreme being and here in the participatory numinous world of all we live in it is this mother that rules she is also called mahamaya she is called gauri she is called kali she is called all these things adi shakti aditi but we know her as bhuvaneshwari the fourth of the mahavidyas but i'll come back to that because what we um learning today is how to stare at the world and see her energy numinous grace everywhere can we do that even in the shittiest of days can i stare into the vastness and see beauty everywhere see that power everywhere i don't mean the void i'm not talking about the void i'm talking about this side of the void the beautiful numinous beautiful being can i see her everywhere can i feel her everywhere right this is what we want to do now because it's one thing to meditate on the void but it's another thing to meditate on the full womb of the golden light of the mother you know me my meditation is primarily on the golden light and she lets manifestation occur health wellness well-being money everything comes everything wonderful comes Yes, bad shit happens. Everybody is going to go through bad shit, but she makes it okay. She makes us see it through a new eye, set of eyes, a new heart, a new being. So, Bhuvaneshwari is all about perception, and 
when we talk about the numinous, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, so what I showed you today was called the Sambhavopaya, which is the Sambhavi Mudra. Shambhavi, sometimes they call it Shambhavi Mudra, but it's Sambhavi Mudra, Sambhavopaya. The path of seeing divinity in everything. That means when I chant Hreem and I gaze upwards, I dissolve my ego into the vast consciousness and I become, I realize that it has come into me and made me conscious. So I accept it. And this feeling of Hreem, Hreem, Hreem is the sound of Bhuvaneshwari cracking everything open. I wanted to talk to you today about an, an English word, a, a Latin word called Numen, Numinus, which is the closest translation to this experience in English, which is the, you know, Rudolf Otto revived the word in 1917 with, and he described it as arousing spiritual or religious emotion, mysterious or awe-inspiring, and he called it the Mysterium Tremendum. That means, just imagine, that it is something you perceive that overwhelms you with the mystery of its magic. And this idea of the Mysterium Tremendum was picked up by Jung, Carl Jung, Maslow, C.S. Lewis in his Narnia Tales, Aldous Huxley in his perennial philosophy talked about the Mysterium Tremendum as an Upanishadic thing, as a Vedic thing, not as a Tantric thing because he didn't know about Tantra. And then Groff used it in describing the LSD experience and Pollock, uh, Poland, Poland, sorry, that's a wrong spelling, described it when, when he took um, DMT and Harris and Dawkins talk about it from the scientific point of view that one can stare at awe at the universe and this painting called the Fam 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 what's it called Framalian is a painting from Hermetic principles of the idea that if I can crack through the veil of this so-called reality, just on the other side of any curtain I pull, any part I take, is a magical reality behind it that opens up to me. This is the fundamental principle that just a little bit beyond perception lies something magical. When uh, Michael Pollan took 5-MeO-DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, which is a form of accelerated DMT, which you get, which is much faster in working than in uh, ayahuasca and other things. He, and Terence McKenna said similar things when he took psilocybin at five grams and more, was that here words fail in truth, there were no flames, no blasts, no thermonuclear storm. I'm grasping at metaphor in the hope of forming some stable and shareable concept of what was unfolding in my mind. In the event, there was no coherent thought, just pure and terrible sensation. Only after did I wonder if this is what the mystics call the mysterium tremendum, the blinding, unendurable mystery of whether of God or some other ultimate or absolute before which humans tremble in awe. Wow. <laughs> so they describe two stages. I describe two stages, which is that the first stage is this idea that I experience the mystery in everything. And I feel awe and grace and beauty and, and this is within the mother's womb. But then certain points when I get to the edge of that reality, I seem to be tumbling out of this reality into something else. I seem to be losing control. I seem to be falling off a precipice and you know that idea of the void, that collapsing into the void, that idea of you know, this vast nothingness seems to be sucking me in, right? So 
What Shaktiism does and the sacred feminine work does, it says, look, that's not how it really is. It's really a loving, beautiful energy that's everywhere for you. And if you experience it, you will enjoy bliss. So if, even if you fall off the cliff, I'm here. Work with me. I'll take you. That's where Shaktiism has so much power. You know, all the Kriyas do is shoot us to the other side. But if we don't do the Hreem and the Shreem, we can't get to the lovely feeling of bliss that will come. So whenever the shamans or the, or the mystics in the Western traditions or in the more masculine Indian traditions go on these extremes, they call it like dying, extreme. It's like fearful death, you know, Kundalini syndrome, all that crap. But the Sri Vidya and Kali Vidya traditions say, no, it's loving. There's nothing to be terrified of. But you must let go. And I'll show you that there is no terror. But you have to let go. So what happens is, it's two different parts to the numinous, right? So on the one hand, the Western esoteric tradition, the Jungian traditions, the, the hermetic traditions, the Kabbalistic traditions, all talk about getting to a point where one is in the face of the beatific vision of God and one is in awe. So it just one, <gasps> oh my God, right? And the, all of them talk about at that point, surrender, let go, Islam. Islam means to surrender. Islam, I surrender, I bow in the face of that awe. Well, Tantra and Shakti says, in the face of that awe, dance, make love, live life, see beauty in everything, experience joy. I don't know about you, but I'd rather go down that path, right? <laughs> I don't want to go down some path where God makes me surrender and crush my knees and says, I beg, I beg, I beg, please forgive me. No, please, please, please. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm a sinner. I'm a useless fellow. I'm nothing. I'm an illusion. I'm a speck of dust on a galaxy with nothing in it. I don't want to be like that. I want to experience the love of this dance that's going on. How can it be anything but love? Yes. <laughs> we also have this ultimate awe. We call it the Turiya state where we kind of go into that black nothingness of Kali or Shiva or Bhairav and we experience that fear. But we know that around it all is beautiful love and grace. In the in-between world, in the Western tradition, in the Gnostic tradition, in the, this is Dante's vision of heaven, it was always considered to be that God would show himself to you as light and you would be taken through this journey of a tunnel, like a near death experience to angels and ancestors would carry you to the other side. It was not dark and gloomy. It was beautiful and angelic and magical. So there was this imminent vision in, in the Shakti tradition. And, and one could look at this numinous, you know, in nature, one could see it in magical realities everywhere you turned in nature and you could create them with your own sacred geometries and your own path like in Sedona or in beautiful hills or anywhere you can create your own magical place to transform your reality. You could do it even in standing on top of a skyscraper in the city and seeing the patterns of unusualness, right? There's beauty and luminosity in that. You can see it in nature. This is dew drops on a spider's web called Indra's net. How you can see that each crystal contains the whole of reality. You can see magic in everything. You can see it even in the most horrible destruction when a volcano goes or a nuclear device goes. There is a moment of awe and shock and bliss at looking at something. Then of course you get wiped out, but that moment is ecstatic. 
people who saw the first atom bombs and nuclear bombs being tested said it was the most beautiful thing they'd ever seen in their lives. A thousand suns lighting up. How can death be so beautiful and luminous? Or you can see it in sensual pleasures of erotic or nature or music or sensuality of any kind. You can sense it. You can feel it. And the most important way to do it, as we did earlier, is in between things, between dark and light, between night and morning, between evening and night, between this and that, between one thought and the other. These in-between states are the surest way to get into these states of consciousness, the Thurya state, the in-between state, between being aware of everything and dreaming, between dreaming and deep sleep, between deep sleep and vast consciousness. All these are in-between states. So I can cultivate in-between states. And the metaphor used is to be like a turtle or a tortoise and withdraw your senses into your inner world and antar mukhi, inwards to see within, to pull yourself in and disconnect from out, and then you will see everything. But then you do it with the eyes open, and you see even more. And the idea is that light comes into the darkest places of your being and removes the cobwebs and removes the crap and burns it all away and clears the path for you. And then you see this luminous, amazing light if you work at it. It comes through. And then you go to the void and you're not scared anymore. So you can go through these journeys of nature. Of, and, and in fact, when, um, when, in 1840s, the, the great poet Ralph Waldo Emerson got a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, translated into English from the German. It was the first time the beautiful book of the Vedanta had come to America. And there were three copies in the whole of the United States and he had one, right? And he read it and he, he said that it was, that he, it was as if he was sitting in the nature worship of the Ganges and absorbing this ancient culture that was coming to him that was teaching him to be in vibration with nature, to be in vibration with each other, to vibrate with everything. And his whole movement of transcendentalism, which led to the Unitarian churches and other things came out of that, right? And, and when you look at the story history of Unitarianism or transcendentalism, you see that they were at that time protesting against industrialization, labor, factory. So while on one hand, Karl Marx was writing about communism and equalizing everybody into a life, they were also in a way talking about a similar thing where they wanted to reconnect with nature. They wanted people to automate more so they could work less in factories and spend more time in leisure and art and poetry. And there was this great movement in the 1800s in Europe and in America to reconnect with nature. And Indian wisdom played a major role in helping that occur. And what they were trying to do was to teach people to be whole. What Carl Jung later called individuation, which means that it wasn't necessary to be perfect. You know how we always talk about super perfect, perfect being, perfect body, perfect yogi, perfect this. It's all bullshit. What they were saying was that, am I a whole person and am I evolving in my wholeness, right? And what does a whole person mean? A whole person mean one who has time and awareness to see this magic in the world. You know, we get so caught up in the work we're doing or in the mantra we're learning or in the focus on a particular type of meditation that we miss the whole luminous wonder that's happening right there in the window or in the nature out there. We miss it completely. So the whole practice here 
is to awaken that luminous quality so that you are able to see the magic all the time you know and this is not meditation this is awareness self-observation that means which me is looking which me is in the world experiencing this moment because I'm so stressed out, did I miss the butterfly fluttering its wings over there? You know, because I'm so anxious about COVID and politics, have I missed the laughter of the child and nature that's calling me, right? Have I forgotten who I am in the pursuit of making money and working 12, 15 hours a day and killing myself? Right? Have I developed cancers and, and ulcers and all kinds of things in my body that because I neglected my love for myself and eating properly and being healthy and healing myself? How did I forget to make love to myself in all these points of my life? Right? So the numinous person is one who is perpetually in awe at the mystery around you, but in a loving grace way that's Shakti, you know, to be with nature, right? To be with each other, to be with love, to be touched by music, you know. How many of you, while sitting there doing your work, put on a piece of music or listen to something you love? Right? It doesn't have to be yogic music for Christ's sake. That's, that's nothing. It can be an old rock and roll tune or a piece of jazz or some hip hop, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Does it make you remember who you are? Does it bring you back to the present over and over again? and be in peak. So the idea of uh, what Laszlo called the peak experience and what Colin Wilson later developed as a technique of transcendence, which was what Emerson and all we're talking about was transcendental magic. That can I have anything, can I cultivate a way of life that I have these peak experiences on a regular basis you know, that's what the Vigyan Bhairav Tantra is all about. That's what this meditation is all about, is to awaken that sensibility in you. If you meditate one hour a day and you're anxious for five, seven hours, what's the use? Give up meditating. Not worth it. You know, just not worth it. Go do something else. Go work out. Go to the gym. Kick ass. I don't know. But don't, don't meditate if it doesn't make you a better person. Don't meditate and do mantras unless you're really a good person and trying hardest to be a good person in everything you do and seeing magic everywhere you go. This is what the numinous life is all about, to be so awe filled of the miracle of this existence that you're perpetually seeing magic in it. You know? Let me tell you a story about uh, Bhuvaneshwari. Ain't short story, not too long. So if you remember when we talked about the Tripura Rahasya, in the beginning of the book, it starts with Om and it ends with Hrim. But that means that it starts with non-dual consciousness, absolute God, the whole thing. And it ends with the mother's womb, Hrim. So that means that reality is best experienced through the mother. Even most of the saints in India would acknowledge that. And this is called the Tripura Rahasya that we went through. If you want to go back to that class, there's a whole class called the, 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 the Three Worlds, you know, the Tripura Rahasya, right? Um, and if you go back to ancient India, 2500 BC, Indus Valley, you see that they tried to domesticate animals, they tried to, but they acknowledged nature was powerful. In fact, the swastika, that you see here is from 2500 BC in India. And it symbolizes 
the movement of the cosmos and nature in every direction around me. That means the awesome movement of stars, of planets, of nature, of seasons, of sun, of moon, and continuously moving round and round and round me. And I'm at the center, spinning it around and round and round. That's what the swastika really means. And if you see some of the seals that they came up with, it was beautiful nature and animals, but sometimes in control, sometimes overcoming vicious nature. But this seal on the right is very interesting. It's a precursor to the goddess worship. And you will see there's a kind of goddess type figure at the top left that they're bowing to. And there are seven divine beings at the bottom. Now, most now agree that these are sacred feminine that later became what is known as the matrikas or the matrikas, the, the, the yoginis, the, the amba, the mother goddess in nature, in nature as goddess, nature as worship. If, and, and you'll see that, that by 1500 in the Rig Veda, there's an entire section of the Rig Veda that's dedicated to Bach, the sound of the goddess. And it says here, I'll read you a couple of them and you can see it in the slides later. But I travel with the Rudras and the Vasus. That means I am the, the energy, the Shakti behind everything. With the Adityas and all the gods, I wonder. And I hold Varuna and Mitra, Indra and Agni and the Ashwins all in my hold. Uh, I hold them up. That means I hold all the elements up. Water, fire, air, storm. I hold all the elements up. I cherish and sustain high swelling soma. That means I control the moon and the sun. And I, 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 I am the queen, the gatherer up of treasures, most thoughtful for those who worship. And then through me alone, all eat the food that feeds them. That means I am the energy that feeds you and I am the you that eats the food that gets the energy. I'm both. I am the sound that men and gods make when they want to talk to, whether it's a Rishi or a sage or a Brahmin. I am the power that makes a man be able to God bend his bow and strike an arrow. I am the one at the summit and I make the father come into being, my God. And then I breathe breath into everything like a tempest and wind. And while I hold together all existence, that means I sustain everything, the mother, and if you look at the Rig Veda, the ancient people of India were not, it wasn't a misogynistic male dominated culture in the early stages. It was equal. They were equally Rishikas. That means female Rishis. And there were male, you know, Rishis. There were seers who could be both men and women. So you have this, and they respected nature. They were fearful of nature. They adored nature. So the greatest goddess was Saraswati, the river that gave them life. You know, and they saw the Saraswati river inside their bodies. And so and then when we later come to the later stages of the development of the Indian psychology, the idea of three aspects of consciousness, the three are, are given names of the three gods, Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Brahma is the god of consciousness, of desire to create life, to make life. Vish, Rudra is the one who destroys life at the end of time and sustains it through his meditation. And Vishnu is the one who keeps the world going and makes everything work properly and lovingly and compassionately to the whole world. But at first, the three of them had no power because they had no Shakti. So they were at the beginning of time, consciousness had three attributes, but no way to manifest anything. And what happens was that a chariot comes along and takes the three of them to a magical city called the Srinagar, Sri Devi's home. And there, before they can enter, they become women. They become three goddesses and they enter this beautiful city of gold the same as the Meru that we have. And they, they enter the city and they go through into the city and they come to this amazing goddess who's sitting there, a red goddess who's sitting on a white male, almost dead passive god. And below her is the 
another god who is the god Bhairav, who is the great protector at the gateway of death. And she sits on this couch, on this sofa called the Pancha Pritashana, and she sits on it, the first mother, and holding the chair up are all the gods of mankind, all these people that have come. So she is the supreme being, Adi Shakti, and they all bow to her. And this has always been represented as Bhuvaneshwari or Mahamaya, the supreme mother, the supreme goddess who controls the whole universe always with five elements holding her up, the five elements of mankind and nature. And there you'll see Shiva lying there, inert, passive, not able to do anything without her power. So she is the supreme being in this metaphor, right? Now what you see here, psychologically, is that she is called the goddess of the seven worlds above and the seven worlds below. So in cosmic terms, imagine that the whole universe is a cosmic egg and she controls seven worlds from Bhu, Bhuva, Swaha, Mahas, Janas, Tapas, Satya, all the way up to heaven. So from earth to heaven, right? She owns the seven spheres and these are the 36 levels of vibration, you can call them also. And also the downward movement of energy into the negative sphere, which is Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Rasatala, Rasarala, Talatala, Mahatala, Vipatala. And the Tals are vibrations earth, below the earth, below your being. They're your Asuric nature, they're your organic nature, they go into you. And the ancients saw it as the seven parts in your body being from the chakras, the Muladhara to Sahasrara being the seven worlds that she controlled above and the lower worlds from Apana below you down, the negative energies where you hold all your earth and your ground down there. So this was the way that they, they described her. And if you see her, the image is always one of a golden energy or a red energy and she's sitting there emanating golden light. And if you see her, she is like, there she is controlling and she creates the universe into which Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva can come and through their Shaktis can create the world. So Shiva has Parvati or Lalita Tripura Sundari, Vishnu has Mahalakshmi or, and, and, and Kamala and Brahma has Saraswati or Matangi and those energies. And so without their Shakti, they cannot do anything in the world. So she is the supreme golden mother who makes the world come into being. And her Bij mantra is Aim Hrim Shrim, Aim Hrim Shrim, Aim Hrim Shrim. And if you want to experience her, the key is to chant Hrim. Now, isn't that a nice story? It's like, a... so if I, if I look at the world, the universe I live in, as a manifestation of this first divine primal consciousness energy that seeds consciousness into every atom, every particle, every element. This is the essence of Shaktiism. That every element in the world is potentially divine. Every element, not every essence or every person or Atma. No, not only my Atma, but me, my every cell of my being is divine. That means that if I can wake up each cell of my being in every cell of being in the universe around me, I can wake up to this divine idea, this numinous awe. And it comes as a golden light of Shreem and Hreem. Hreem is the sound of Lajja Gauri, Lajja Hreem. Lajja means that The consciousness of the energy is coming into me 
but I don't know it. I've forgotten. So I'm ashamed. I feel small. I feel puny. Lajja means shame. I feel like I'm tiny. Then I can get exploited and be called a sinner and, a, and a unworthy and punishable. And I become small. So this khareem sound is the waking up to the realization that this immense universal consciousness is coming into you, into every cell of your being, and planting that into every cell of you. But you have to remember who you are. And then when you say shreem, all of that goes back to the source which it came from and realizes itself as that first mother. Shreem, she is Shri Devi. So she becomes Shreem, Bhuvaneshwari. Shreem, she goes back to her. Hreem, from her we come into being. Shreem, we go back to her. Hreem, Shreem, Hreem. And I'm is the first sound that Maha Adi Shakti utters to make all the worlds come into being, for consciousness to flow into us. So it's the flow from that Om, that primeval Om, becomes I'm, and then Hreem, and it comes into us. And then Shreem, I acknowledge and return to her. I'm Hreem, Shreem, I'm Hreem, Shreem, I'm Hreem, Shreem. You can do a three-part mantra in one of two ways. Yes, you can do Om at the beginning, you can do Swaha and Namaha at the end, that's all fine. But the better way is to cycle it or to infinitely Aksharmala it to infinity. So you can go, I'm Hreem Shreem, I'm Hreem Shreem, I'm Hreem Shreem, I'm Hreem Shreem, or you can go, I'm Hreem Shreem, Shreem Hreem, I'm, and loop it. Now both, one has the power to move up and down through your system. I'm Hreem Shreem, Shreem Hreem, I'm, like I'm clean, so, so clean, I'm is Lalita. Same way, I'm Reem, Shreem, Shreem, Reem, I'm is Bhuvaneshwari. And then I can infinity it. So I keep yearning for her. I'm Reem, Shreem, I'm Reem, Shreem, I'm Reem, Shreem, I'm Reem, Shreem. Or I can just chant Reem. Reem. So when I open my eyes and I gaze out at the world, it is the act of seeing, of perceiving, that is the act of being worshipping of Bhuvaneshwari. That means that she is able to show me the reality of what the universe is like. I want to read you one thing before I stop from Guruji Amritananda. When he talks about Bhuvaneshwari, he says that integrating, unifying knowledge begins with Bhuvaneshwari. The seven worlds below and the seven worlds starting from this earth above rise from the act of seeing. The act of seeing is Bhuvaneshwari. She is known as Maya or the Shuddha Vidya. What comes before knowledge? Sometimes it is the act of seeing or perception. That means you feel or see the numinous before Gyan comes. Sometimes it is one device which makes the act of seeing happen. Maybe an accident or a phenomena or an experience. Knowledge has two origins. What coming, one coming from the sensory perception is the first origin. And among the second class of knowledge, there are two further divisions. I'll come to, we'll come to that later. The Upashana of Bhuvaneshwari is an attempt to receive such knowledge of God as a direct experience. The basic idea here is that the restriction of an individual consciousness is an artificially imposed one. And it is possible to transcend this by means of the following way. And then he says that then, and I'll share this with you. I just please remind me and I'll share it with you. And she is called Maya, illusion. Ma is to measure and it's the space which measures the immeasurable. That means she is the universe that keeps track of all this coming into being. To the tantric, Maya is the infinite consciousness having the power to clothe itself in finite forms. That means that all the numinous things we see in the world that open us up is Maya, is this goddess. 
not illusion, but goddess. And the mantra of Bhuvaneshwari is Hrim, meaning illusion. It is a constant reminder not to fall into illusions of focus, of detail, but to see beyond the unifying identity underlying all. And so Om, Hrim, Om is the core mantra. Anyway, Hrim is known as to the tantrics as the Lajja Bija, implying shrinking and not free. That means I'm limited in my knowledge. I want to be free. And therefore, manifestation has not fully blossomed in me. So I must wake up. So, just think about it. I, every cell of me is limited and wants to explode into full form. And so the numinous, when I see it in the world, it is my opportunity to wake up to that divine idea. That I'm not limited to these cells and this body. This is the whole teaching. And so therefore Maya, the Hreem, is the illusion that I'm separate from her. So I call her in, Hreem, and I go back to her, Shreem, and I say, I explode. Let's go. Back. Collapse into the Bindu and off to the other side. So when we experience the whole objective of Tantra here, is not to become perfect, but to realize in every breath, in every moment of your day, in every activity you do, that you are whole, that you are a complete being who is unfolding, that you are already divine, but you're just unfolding towards it. Maybe in this life you don't get perfection, but you get whole. You become well-rounded. You become a good person. And what he's saying there is that Hreem is the sound you make when you get caught up in too much technique, too much, how many times did I do 108? Did I do this? Did I do this correctly? Did I say it correctly? That's obsessive, missing the whole point. Hreem is to remind you that you are not that illusion. You're not that limiting idea. Sound good? <laughs>